as you mourn, as you grieve, as you celebrate, and this last word, as you remember your beloved pastor, be strong in the Lord. Be courageous. Don't give in to fear and know that God's presence is with you. He'll be with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Good, good morning. All right, I want to be all arise. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Let's get up and let's prep ourselves to worship the Lord. So everybody on your feet. <clears throat> all right. Welcome to Every Nation Church, Malaysia. My name is Neil. Say hi, Neil. All right, I'm one of the pastors in this church. Uh, so on behalf of all the pastors, I want to welcome you guys if it's your first time here with us. You know, um, you know, it's been a crazy past two weeks. You know, and uh, singing stuff. Um, but in the midst of it all, I, uh, if there's one thing that I'm thankful for, is spiritual family. You know, and, um, you know, we, the pastors, have been overwhelmed, in fact, encouraged by every one of y'all who've been messaging us, texting us, uh, just checking in on us and stuff. And we do the same, by the way. It's not just us. It's just not one way, but we also check on you guys and stuff. But we've been encouraged by the amount of support and encouragement over the past two weeks, you know, and, um, and that's what spiritual family does. You know, we encourage one another, we love one another, and uh, we be there for one another. And uh, just wanna, I just want to ride on that thought this morning, uh, especially in the book of Psalms 139, in regards to where God is in all of this, all right? So in Psalms 139, verse 7, it says this, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, 
and your right hand shall hold me. And that's where God is. God is with us. God is for us. No matter where we go, no matter how far we run, God is next to us and God is in us. This is the God that we serve. This is the God we will worship today and forever always. This is the God that we take comfort, we take refuge. This is the God, our God. So I want everybody to lift up your hands right now and just commit this time unto the Lord. Knowing that God is our ultimate comforter, our ultimate strength, our source of peace, our source of joy, our source of love. If you are here broken this morning, let me tell you, remind you, encourage you that God is close to the brokenhearted. If you are someone in this place that search for healing, let me tell you that this God is mindful of you and He can heal you because our God is mindful of us. We thank you, God, for who you are. We thank you, God, that we get to call you Abba, Father. We thank you, God, knowing that, God, you will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, God, that despite of who we are, God, you still chose to love us. And God, we are forever grateful. That is who you are. And we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all worship. Good morning, church. Let's lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we worship you, Lord.
great comforter, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. You're secure in you.
We worship an awesome God. We worship a good God. We worship a faithful God, a God who's protective over us, our defender, our hope, our source of strength. This is the God that we worship. And this is the God that we praise. Why don't you look to your neighbor and say, it's so much better with God. You know, why don't we give the worship team a clap offering, you know, they did us. Thank you for leading us into worship. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, God is good. And all the time. All right. With that, we're getting into 3 to 1. We're not running away from 3 to 1. So everybody fix your eyes on the screen. And let's get to know somebody. Three minutes, two questions, one person. Great. And as here, everybody get uh, talking with somebody, uh, 
And that's how it's supposed to be during three to one, okay? Aside from your toilet breaks that some of you guys like to go towards the during the three to one, but this is how it should be, all right? Okay, once again, welcome to Urban Nation Church Malaysia. My name is Neil, and I'm one of the pastors uh, in this church. And uh, so this morning, I said I am thankful for spiritual family. Just want to thank everybody for their encouragement and their support for us uh, in the pastoral team, you know, and uh, we're going to build this house together. All right, tell your neighbor, uh, we're going to build this house together. All right, and uh, another thing that I'm thankful this morning is it's my wife's birthday. Okay, and um, she's not here. Some people are wondering whether I have a wife. Uh, first time when they meet my wife, they're like, oh, this is your wife. Yes, she's real. So uh, if you know her, greet her. If you do not know her, keep wondering. Uh, <laughs> But she's, she, uh, she's amazing. Today's a birthday. I have no idea I'm going to take her, but I just want to say that because I have the mic and I can wish my wife this morning. So happy birthday to my wife. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's that. Okay, straight to church again. Um, offering. Let's do offering. All right. No, let's not do offering. Let's do first timers. Okay, if it's your first time here, in our church, thank you uh, for coming and visiting us. We do have a Connect Corner on the side, uh, so please make your way over there. We have our leaders and our pastors who would love to get in touch with you, meet you, get to know you, and um, yeah, and, and, and if all goes well, we would love to be part of your family as well, all right? So please uh, meet us at the Connect Corner. If you guys are watching online, you guys know the drill, scan the QR code, and we will connect with you. Okay, offering. So this morning, as, as I mentioned, God is for us. God will never leave us nor forsake us because this is the God that we serve. So in the same posture, uh, let's be in faith, giving unto his kingdom. All right. So you guys know the drill. Scan the QR code. There are ways of giving and all and stuff. But if you guys love to give physically, you guys can do so um, right outside. There's a box in which you guys can drop all the offering. All right. <clears throat> but other than that, that's the drill. Let me pray for those who are giving. God, we thank you for you are a good God. Um, and God, we give in faith, knowing that this is for the advancement of your kingdom. We thank you for those generous givers. Bless them. Uh, bless everybody in this place. Bless those who are believing in faith as well for things to come. God, we thank you because this is the God that we serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. All right, I only got two announcements. Say two announcements. Okay, first one is Obey. Okay, so Obey is our water baptism platform. So if you guys have yet to be baptized or if you know somebody who wants to get baptized, this is for you guys. Okay, there's a couple of prerequisites, but um, best to get in touch with your life group leaders for those details. But take on the dates. It's on the 27th of April. And also the 28th of April right here in our main building. All right. So scan the QR code, especially for those who really want to consider taking the step of faith of obedience. Um, uh, yeah. So please do so. All right. So that's the obey announcement. The other one is discovering God. Okay. So discovering God is a platform uh, in which we can have open and honest and unthreatening conversations about God. So you can talk about anything and everything, ask the most toughest questions during this discussion because I am not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I'm so sure that our pastors who are involved in this platform, they will be able to handle it. All right. So, but again, scan the QR code. So if this is you, and if you know somebody who is so hard-headed about God, then this is definitely for them as well. All right, so scan the QR code, and we will see you on the dates provided on the screen. All right, that is it for my announcement. Today is my honor and a privilege to, to share and introduce the speaker this morning. Uh, some of you guys are still getting to know him. I've known him for years now. Uh, fun fact is this. Um, you guys heard of our worship band, Echo, all right? Before Echo, it was um, One Accord, okay? Uh, earlier days were called 1 a.m., okay? And this pastor was actually one of the singers, one of the songwriters of the worship band that time here in our Every Nation Church, Malaysia. Not a lot of people know this. When I stepped in, that's when he resigned. <laughs> 
No, I'm just kidding. He went to plant a church, all right? But ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to our senior pastor, Pastor Sean. Thank you, Pastor Neil. Good morning, church. Yay. It's good to be here. Yes, uh, when, I, when Pastor Neil joined the ministry, I realized that that's what singing meant. And therefore, you know, my singing career uh, has prematurely also uh, come to an end. But uh, it's good to be here. You know, one of the, first, one of the things that I'm really thankful for, uh, it's really the support and the unity of the church. I said it last night in our prayer meeting. And I really, as a past, to represent the pastoral team, we are so thankful for all your prayers, all your texts, all your support. So many one of you came up to us and said, Pastor, how could we help out? How could we lighten the load? How could we do this together? And for that, I think we are so thankful. We are so, are so encouraged. The other thing I'm thankful for is really for this Every Nation Global Spiritual Family. Um, for the last one week, we had pastors and leaders from 11 nations that flew in to just to be with us, to bring comfort, to bring encouragement, and also some of them to help us transition through this difficult period of our church. So that is the two things uh, that I'm really thankful for as I reflect uh, back the week or the last two weeks. Uh, I want to start by showing this uh, picture. Uh, this picture was taken in Chinese New Year 2023. Okay, I know Joel is uh, probably in... Japan at that time. And every year, uh, Pastor Timothy and Teresa, they will uh, visit us during Chinese New Year. And uh, every time he visit, uh, he will play chess with my daughter, Kristen. My, uh, Kristen is 16 years old now. Kristen is the same age as uh, Joanna. And Pastor Tim will talk about football with my two sons, uh, Shane and uh, Joash. Shane is 14 and uh, Joash is 7 years old, right there in blue. Uh, not the purple one. Uh, that's a different Joash. Uh, but the blue color, Joash, and we intentionally get them to stand together. Uh, and we'll, Pastor Tim will make jokes with uh, Faith. Faith is 10 years old, and if you see her, uh, she would like to give you riddles, and she would like to uh, basically tell you jokes that she hears and she gathers. And I am amazed that when I tell her the joke, and she say, that's so lame, dead Daddy. <laughs> and one month later, she's telling it to everybody else. And I say, Faith, I thought that was lame. He says, yeah, it's the way you tell it, she said. <laughs> but anyways, <clears throat> uh, my wife Jill and I, we have been married for 16 years. The first eight years were good. The second eight years were great. Okay. <laughs> you know, some of you are getting nervous there. Okay, anyway, uh, Jill right now, is, she's preaching in Damansara Church. And uh, it, was her f it, it is her first time this week preaching after 12 years. And the preaching is arranged uh, three months ago because of the topic that we spoke. And uh, she's right there. I wonder how she is doing. Okay? But we actually start, we, we wanted to start this series called Wholeness in God. And this is a series of mental health. And I believe that this series is potentially one of the most important series uh, this year that we want to do because, because mental health challenge is so real. And we believe that mental health challenge is the greatest battlefield in our 21st century. Depression is real. Anxiety is real. Grief is real. And the different things that we go through, it's real. and it's a personal series for me as well because uh, I had people in my life, my mother-in-law, before she passed on, she was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar. Uh, and over just last six weeks, I had personal conversation with two persons, separate occasion, that is suffering from, one is from anxiety, one is from depression. One is a believer in our church, and the other one is an unchurched person who a church member wanted to bring him to meet me. And as he was sharing with me his depression a journey about his suicidal thoughts, and he was telling me that, you know, Pastor, that day when I had according to his word, dumb thoughts that is coming into my mind. 
you know what, Pastor? I was driving around, making calls, Googling uh, for you know, uh, uh, clinics and, 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 and psychiatrists. I was calling and, Pastor, you know what? He says, most of the numbers that I called, they were full. They're already full in terms of appointments. So I had to like round from Klang to Satya Alam all the way to Kota. And finally, he found a clinic in Kota Damansara that he's able to meet. And he was diagnosed with uh, uh, chronic depression and was prescribed uh, medication. It is real. And sitting here, you may be going through some of these mental health challenges or you may have loved ones that is going through or, or have gone through some of these mental health challenges. And this is the key verse that anchors this series. And I want to like to invite all of us to read this together. One, two, go. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. You know, this is a letter that Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Thessalonica and he was, this probably took place about 20 years after Jesus Christ resurrected and ascended to heaven and he was addressing this church during his second missionary journey and he was encouraging them to hold firm in their faith, to look towards the eternal hope in Christ as they go through life as a Christians in a pagan a world in the midst of various hardship and persecution. And Paul was encouraging them that, hey, it is God Himself. Reminding the Christian that it is God Himself will sanctify you completely. The message version say God will make you whole. And that's where we get the title of our series, Made Whole. That God Himself will made us, make us whole a whole spirit, soul, and body. Not just spirit. I think as, as, I mean, in, in the Christian world, we speak about the spirit and rightly so. But maybe we have not spoken enough about our soul and body. And as we speak about mental health challenges, it's really about the soul. Um, as we talk about this series, there are potentially two extreme views when it comes to mental health disorder. Two extreme Christian views about mental health disorder. On one side, it is over-spiritualized mental health disorder. That the view is that when someone has mental health disorder, the person is either uh, having demonic attack uh, or being punished by sin or generational curses. It's all only about that. And the solution is deliverance, prayer, and deliverance and prayer. Nothing else but that. That's the one side of the pole. And the other side of a view is an over-naturalized view about mental health disorder that we are quick to pinpoint to it is because of neurochemical in the brain that is, that is imbalanced. So the only solution is only medication, medication, medication. Now the danger of these two perspectives is that we oversimplify something that is very complex that we are oversimplifying something that is very complex. Yes, it is a mixture of all kinds of factors. Yes, it is spiritual, it is emotional, it is psychological, it is environmental, it is all these things that is at play. So this series, we hope to bring about that awareness that we want to uh, advocate a holistic view, a biblical and holistic view of, when it comes to mental health um, disorder. And this series, we want to ask the question, about how as Christians do we view mental health disorder? We want to ask the question that if we are going through anxiety and depression, is that, as a Christian, is it, is, is it something wrong with my faith? Why doesn't God answer my prayer of healing? Am I uh, less of a Christian if I'm going through, if I'm diagnosed with bipolar? That's the question that we want to answer as well. And what do we do as we go through this journey? And also we want to talk about as a church, how can we be a bridge to the wholeness that can be found in God? Okay, so uh, biblically, there is no exact term of mental health disorder that you can find in the Bible. However, there is terminology like madness or insanity that you can find uh, in the Bible. In the Old Testament, madness or insanity is, you can find that about 19 times in the Old Testament. People like King David, King Nebuchadnezzar, they have period of time where they were mad or insane. 
In the New Testament, there is this word, Greek word called minomai, which is the root word for the English word maniac. And it was found about eight times in the New Testament. So even though the word mental health disorder is not, the term is not found in the Bible, but we can find expression of the uh, emotional and mental expression of mental health challenges all throughout the Bible. And these are just some examples. In Psalms, you can find the psalmist speaks about how their soul is depressed and downcast, sorrow, right? You can find verse like says, my heart failed me. My heart is overwhelmed. Uh, waves overwhelmed, weary with crying, walking through fire. Uh, you can find words like brokenhearted, crushed in the spirit, afflicted, mourning, our spirit and our body is fainting. So we have all these various expression that is found in the Bible that portray mental health challenges at play. Obviously, Matthew, Jesus himself, he was deeply grieved to the point of death. So how as Christians, how do we view mental health disorder? A quick overview is that we, are, we want to remind ourselves that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. Psalms 139 that we are made in a perfect relationship with God and it is in a perfect world and we are holistic beings. As human, we are holistic beings. We are not just a spiritual being, but we are a physical being, emotional being, as well as we are a mental being. And that's why I think in the New Testament, we were asked to love our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength because there are many different aspects as a, as a human being. Uh, Jesus, I think in Luke, was saying that Jesus grew uh, in stature. Right? He grew in stature. He grew in wisdom, mind, stature, physical. And He grew in favour with God and man, spiritual and relational as well. So we are a holistic being and you cannot separate one from the other. However, we know that when sin came, it corrupts everything, including our mental uh, our minds and not just our spirit. We know sin has broken our relationship with God. We know that. But at the same time, sin has also corrupt our relationship with one another. And that's why shortly after the fall, you have the, the murder of Cain and Abel. Sin also corrupts our emotional and as well as our mind as well. The Bible has many verses that speaks about how our minds are being corrupted. Weakened mind, default minds, depraved minds, evil minds. and rebe So these are some of the, the verses that speaks about how when sin came into the picture, our mind is being corrupted as well. But the ultimate hope is really when we know that God will restore every aspect of creation. Not just our spirit, not just our body. When we, in heaven, we have a heavenly body. Revelation 21 speaks about there will be no more crying, no more pain, no more diseases, that God brings about that restoration. At the same time, when it comes to mental health challenges, that we have that ultimate hope that that aspect will also be restored. A quick overview, mental health disorder is part of a complex fallenness of God's creation. Thus, it is also part of God's redemptive plan. So today, we want to address the question, what do we do when we are going through mental health challenges like grief, anxiety, depression, what do we do as we go through it? I think the key word here is through it. It's easy to wanting to contend for healing and recovery and we should do that and that will be sp spoke about in the other weeks. But today we want to talk about what do we do as we are going through that journey of pain. We want to look at King David's psalm. And King David is someone who is um, very familiar to pain and sorrow, right? He lost his son. He lost his friend, Jonathan, in a, in a battle, his best friend. He was being hunted and betrayed by his father-in-law, his king, King Saul. Uh, he was betrayed by his son, Absalom, and usurped him of power. And King David is someone who know, who experienced um, challenges and pain. And he wrote this. He says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. Say the word distress. And he says that my eyes is wasted from grief. And obviously a lot of 
crying involved. He says, my soul and my body also. You can see that how grief has, uh, distress has affected his whole being. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with signing, my strength fails because of my iniquity. Again, intertwined with spirit and my bones waste away. So grief, as we talk about grief, grief affects our whole being. And I'm sure a lot of us here for the last two weeks, we are in this journey of grieving as well. It affects our sleep. It affects our work. It affects our thinking. It affects our strength. And sometimes we just feel that our body is weak because grief affects our whole being and grief is exhausting. It says here, our strength fails and grief is complex. Grief is something that we, that is common, but not commonly spoke about. Similarly, depression, similarly, anxiety, common emotion, mental health challenges, but less common spoke about. I know psychology spoke about grief in these stages of grief, denial, anger, depression, bargaining and acceptance, and different one of us is in the various journey, various point of this journey. But in reality, it is complex. In reality, it's, it looks more like this, that we go through roller coaster. And that explains why when we are in that journey of depression, why there are some weeks that we are doing okay. And sometimes when there is trigger and we, felt, we fall into that, that depressive uh, a season and, and depressive pit once again, because it is that journey. So what do we do? And the answer is found in the first verse that we read just now. God's grace to it all. David know that in the midst of all that, David asked for the grace of God. He says, be gracious to me, O Lord. And this word grace, it is not just the saving grace of God, but it is also the sustaining grace that sustains us. And this New Testament word grace is the word charis that speaks about the loving kindness, the unmerited favour, the blessings, the, the goodness, the goodwill, and potentially all this English word may not be fully be able to capture the essence or the height and depth of God's grace. And that's why when John Newton wrote the song and he has no other words to describe God's grace except the amazing grace of God. So when we go through darkness, depression, grief, we want to ask for God's grace to be with us. The grace of God allow us to continue on when we feel like giving up. The grace of God helps us to stand when we feel like falling down. What about Apostle Paul? Paul himself has gone through many hardships as well. And there is this thorn that was described that Apostle Paul was going, uh, was, was experiencing. And let me read this in 2 Corinthians. He says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now, we have experienced uh, a, a wooden splinter. Uh, maybe sometimes we, we, we are barefooted or we, we handle some, some wood uh, items and we have splinter, that little wood piece that is stuck underneath our skin, and that's a splinter. But this thorn, nobody, no, a lot of scholars was trying to guess what this thorn meant, but it wasn't clear. And this word thorn, it is a... Uh, the word used for a tent stake. You know, when they pitch a tent, they have that stake that... So it was describing a thorn that is maybe of this size, that he felt it was given to him in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. He says, three times I pleaded with, the, with God about this. I, Paul pleaded three times, for potentially more than that, for God to take away this thorn. A lot of scholars thought that this thorn could be a physical illness. It could be that, that, that extreme stress of being in danger all the time. He had to run from city to city. He was beaten. He was, he was threatened. 
Some scholars believe it was spiritual, as mentioned here. It was a spiritual thorn. Um, so there's many, maybe it's a combination of all these things that Paul was experiencing and he pleaded with God, will you take it away? And sometimes that's what we go through as well, right? When we go through depression and anxiety, we go through um, challenges and we pleaded with God, God, would you take it away? We hear testimonies of people say, okay, you know, I prayed to God and I was healed. Praise God. The whole life group, the whole church clap. And when we pray, nothing seems to be happening. We pleaded, we pleaded, we prayed, and we prayed. We got people to pray for us. But we are still going through that journey of darkness and challenge. Guess what? God, instead of removing the thorns, God gave Paul the grace. But he said to me, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. The sustaining grace. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God did not remove the thorn for Apostle Paul. Can you imagine? Apostle Paul, the guy who went all over Europe and, and, and just to plant churches, the, God did not remove his thorn, but instead God gave him the grace to sustain. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, sometimes God do not remove the challenge, but God give us grace to go through that challenge so that the glory and the power of God may be displayed so that when we boast, we boast of the grace and the power of God. So what do we do when we go through it? God's grace through it all. Tim Keller said this. He says, God, God's reckless grace is our greatest hope that in the midst of that journey, in the midst of that tunnel, we experience the depth of God's sustaining grace. You know, we also put together an interview of uh, Chai. Chai came for our yesterday's service and some of you who have been here, I think Chai did an interview here uh, maybe three, four years ago just sharing about her journey uh, of depression and, 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 and how she has, how she has hold on to God's grace and in the midst of all that she's going through, there are people around him, community that, that is encouraging her, supporting her. And as you watch the video, it's about four minutes. As you watch the video, pay attention to the glimpses of God's grace that help her journey through this dark path. Okay, you can watch the video. Hi, I'm Chai. Years ago, I shared about my journey through the depths of depression. At my worst, I woke up every day just to think about the best way to end my life. I was dysfunctional, isolated, incapacitated, and living in profound darkness, both physically and mentally. I spent several weeks confined to my tiny room and survived on only biscuits and water. I had no energy or motivation to even get out of bed. The condition in my room was so terrible. The echo was leaking, the lights no longer working, and once I even found maggots on the floor. Taking care of personal hygiene seems pointless when I just wanted to die. I was given multiple medications to cope, but that took a while because of trial and error. Most of the time, I felt like a zombie, a fat one, because I gained almost 20 kgs from the side effects. Depression rocked everything away from me. My studies, my confidence, my body image, my friends, and my ability to enjoy life like any other 20-year-old. I didn't have any hope for the future. Those dark days left me feeling ashamed. Yet, they also reminded me that I am alive today only because of the grace of God. I once hoped to be completely and immediately healed from depression. But I've come to understand that Victory over depression doesn't mean total eradication of struggles in this life. Rather, it means having the assurance 
that even in this ongoing battle, God's grace is more than sufficient to sustain and preserve me. I've come to know that I still can experience God's presence and lead a purposeful life, even in the struggles of depression. Though there are days when I still find myself paralyzed by the weight of depression, I take comfort in the unchanging nature of God's love and His word. I hold on to Psalms 139, which says, God knows my thoughts and feelings, even the darkest ones, and that even if I made my bed in hell, God is there. In my brokenness, I found myself turning to prayer, lamenting to God just like David in the Psalms. It is in those lowest moments that I recognize that God alone is my strength and refuge. I also learned that depression is not a battle that I can win alone. It was through the support and care of the church community that I began to find healing. I learned to open up about my struggles, to let go of the fear and shame that once kept me down. I allowed leaders to speak into my life, to pray for me when I couldn't find the words. Many like Pastor Tim, Teresa, Pastor Agape, and Zoe literally went to the prayer wall on my behalf, knocking on heaven's door and asking God to preserve my life. They shared my burden and allowed me space and time to recover. They pointed me back to the hope in Christ. My journey may seem far from where I thought I should be, but I've learned to be faithful where God has placed me, whether on the mountain or in the valleys. As I grow to depend on the sustaining power of God's grace, I get to witness how my dark, ugly story can be used by God to bring encouragement and hope to others going through similar struggles. He redeems my pain and uses it for good. Through it all, God reminds me that He is with me in this prolonged depression. There is hope and healing, no matter how deep or how long the despair. God's grace is indeed sufficient and ever-present. A hand. What an encouraging story. And today, you know, she, she will tell you that there is that journey of up and down, but she is, God is using her to bring encouragement in different platforms to speak about this area. You know, it's really a holistic journey of recovery, of different aspects of community and prayer and, and counselling and in certain instances, maybe medication is required. So there is really a holistic a journey of recovering and healing. So today, if you are going through some sort of a mental health challenge, break out from that stigma to think that uh, we are our faith is not strong enough or am I punished for this or am I less of a Christian that I'm going through this? But I want you to know that if you are going through that, know that you are in Christ. That you are in Christ. Even though you may be going through depression and taking medication, medication and therapy, that you are in Christ. That you are in Christ even though you are going through those uh, emotion and mental health challenges. Number two, know that you are not alone. Reach out to someone that you can trust. You know, a lot of times there are people around you who loves you and cares for you, but they may not know what to do, what not to do, what to say and not, what not to say. But there are people who cares for you and who loves you. And just like that conversation that I had with that person, it is out of care and love that his friend brought him to come and have a conversation with me. And number three, that you are in that journey of healing and recovery. That we know that our ultimate hope is in Christ. That our, our ultimate hope of recovery is in Christ. As I end today's message before we have dialogue, I want to revisit the verse again. He says, May the God of peace himself. That God did not outsource this to his angels. He did not. But God himself will sanctify. Sanctify means made whole. Bring into completion. He will sanctify us completely 
and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, our mind included, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise is this, that He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Do what? Make us whole. Spirit, soul, and body. I want to invite all of us to stand and I want to pray. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Maybe we can close our eyes just to allow us to focus and to give privacy. Maybe standing here today, some of this message, content of this message resonate with you. Some of you, maybe you're going through a season of, you feel like you are going through depression. You feel like you're having that anxiety, insomnia. You are going through this journey. Some of you, maybe you are in the journey of therapy, of counselling, of medication. Or some of you, maybe you are struggling in silence and you don't know who to reach out to. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that wherever you are standing here, God, you know. You know those of us who may be silently suffering and we don't know who to turn to and we feel like we have to put on a mask to pretend that everything is okay. And we want to tell that it is okay not to be okay. That we acknowledge that. And that's the beginning of the journey of recovery and to receive God's grace and to receive help and to receive love and care from people and receive prayer and to receive basically help God Lord, in this journey of recovery. God, we pray for those of us who is going through God Lord, that you minister to us, that your, your sustaining grace your sustaining grace just like how you have sustained David and, and, and Paul your sustaining grace may come upon us because for when we are weak, that you are strong in our lives, that the power of Christ may come upon us and to rest in us. God's grace through it all. For some of us, I want to pray, God, like if you are potentially a caregiver or you are a family member or a friend of someone who is going through mental health challenges, if that's you, or maybe I just want to just, you, you can just raise your hands wherever you are. If you are a caregiver or you have family, friends, colleagues who is going through that mental health challenge, you can just raise your hands. I want to pray for us. God, I pray, God, Lord, that wherever we are, whether it's a, it's a friend, it's a loved one, a relative, a colleague, I pray right now, God, Lord, those who, whose, whose hands are lifted, I pray you will give us the compassion, you, I pray that you will give us that, 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 that empathy, that wisdom to be able to, to connect, to show care, God, Lord. That we will also begin to read up, to just begin to equip and bring awareness of this uh, mental health challenge world so that we are better equipped to be that bridge, to help them to seek help. For some of us, maybe it's a practical help to help them with their kids or maybe to fetch them, to bring them to see a counsellor or maybe for us to pray with them bring them towards the community. God, whatever help, God, Lord, that you will grace us, God, Lord, to be that bridge, to be that church to those who are hurting outside, God, Lord. God, we thank you, God, Lord. Help us to grow in our awareness and our empathy in this area, Lord, as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right. I'm going to pass the time. Right. All right, uh, you guys can take a seat. We're going to prep ourselves for dialogue and, um, you know, just a couple of things. You know, one of my favorite songs uh, in Maverick City, if you guys heard of Maverick City, one of my favorite songs from Maverick City is um, Firm Foundation, okay? And one of my favorite lines over there is in the second verse where it says, I still got joy in chaos. I got peace that makes no sense. You know, and that line struck a chord in me mainly because we talk about peace, we know about peace, we probably read up what the definition of peace is. 
You know, in despite of, def- of whatever that definition may be about the word peace, um, there is this peace that goes beyond understanding and that only God can provide. You know, so just want to remind everybody, you know, like this peace, you don't have to understand it. You just have to accept it. All right. Uh, with that said, um, the guys already prepped. I just want to remind everybody after the service, there'll be some prayer ministers up here lined up. And if you guys need prayer for whatever reason it may be, uh, please come up to the front and the ministers will pray for you guys. All right. So dialogue. Right. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we have here today uh, Elaine, which is actually a, a licensed uh, counselor. Uh, with the Maga. Uh, she's also uh, helping us to lead the uh, Arini ministry. Uh, you have any, if you have been to counseling or need counseling, uh, she's the right person to speak to. Um, I think it's a, a very apt season for us to go through this series right now. But let's kick off the, 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 the conversation this morning. Uh, Pastor, you mentioned there was a, sometimes we oversimplify things, right? We, we think that it's either spiritual or it's a physical thing or that. How do we then navigate this complexity in a, a little bit easier handles? How do we navigate through this? Yeah, I, I think it's first and foremost for us to maybe find out more about this area. I think in preparation for this series, I, I reached out to Elaine to recommend me some books, some articles for me to read up um, from a Christian perspective, from a, you know, a professional perspective, just to understand a little bit more. I think that will help us to be able to navigate through, uh, I think it's, uh, that two view is just for us to be aware so that we are not quick to immediately jump towards uh, one opposing, uh, 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 but it's really to acknowledge that it is complex. And different cases is different, right? Different cases requires, uh, maybe it's because of different factors that triggers and uh, that mental health uh, challenges or disorder. And I think the first and foremost is to educate ourselves, be aware, and then uh, so that we can, uh, so that we can be uh, holistic in our view of helping people to recover and to heal. Yeah, that's for me. Okay. A um, lot of questions are flooding in, so keep your questions coming and I'll do my best to um, bring it out. Okay. First question, how do I know if this person is really depressed or is merely seeking attention as a narcissist? Okay, so hard question you take or I take? <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, depression, narcissist is uh, two different uh, mental health condition, right? So maybe let's break it down a bit. If you're talking about depression, um, again, uh, I'll reiterate, reiterate that uh, we do not take the word depression lightly as now it's often being used that I'm depressed, therefore I don't feel good and I don't want to go to work and tomorrow I'm okay. Oh, I can go to work. So if it's clinically depressed, yeah, it is serious, means it has to be prolonged symptoms over a period of time, two weeks and so on. And there must be certain criteria of certain symptoms that must be uh, visible and evident, right? So, um, as, as uh, for narcissists, it's basically a type of personality disorder, right? <coughs> if it's that falls into that category, then probably, again, we do not want to misdiagnose or simply put terms into, you know, your narcissist you know, and so on, unless we really have uh, a professional to take a look at it. So, um, first of all, is that there must be certain symptoms that is evident, yeah? And, of course, a period of time, and of course, when you talk about whether it's attention-seeking or not, yeah, uh, I believe that uh, we all need to uh, also be equipped first to uh, educate ourselves, um, to read up, to know more, uh, to even ask around uh, from professional to know that, okay, I see this person, I do not know what to do, so how should I go about it? So we dissect it with you so that uh, at least you do not jump onto it and quickly make an uh, assumption. All right? Okay. Anything else? I think for me, probably it's a benefit of a doubt. I think when you see someone, uh, the, the recent case that it was because the guy posted his, his emotional thing on, on, on social media and alerted the friend. 
so I think it's really a benefit of doubt and sometimes it's just a message or just say, hey, I saw, is everything okay with you? I think just a simple question like that helps. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, having a proper diagnosis is important. There are tests available and there are professionals help that we need to go through or process that we need to go through in order to identify the situation or the, or the issue. Okay, there's another question here is, can someone in severe depression still serve as a frontline leader in church? For example, a pastor, a ministry leader, an LG leader. Will it set a bad example if someone is having severe depression and still serving? Well, uh, we have to look at whether the functionality of the person, whether the person is able to function at the basic uh, level. Like, for example, able to uh, lift up himself or herself up from bed, to work, to eat, to take care of personal hygiene. So from my point is that I will look at the basic functioning of the person first, and then to be able to look at whether the person is able to uh, relate with people. Yeah, because that will be the... the, the, um, the um, because we, we, we are not alone, so we need to be in relationship with people. So sometimes certain conditions would make us very awkward in our behavior, in our speech as well. Right? So basic uh, general functioning and then able to relate, able to, and, and able to lead as a, as a leader. Yeah, so if you are able to see that certain leaders, perhaps maybe you are experiencing uh, certain uh, mental health challenges at this moment do not delay further uh, because you need to uh, get yourself functioning first and then move on and so on to be effective as a leader. I guess it's always great to lead or minister from a point of that our soul is healthy. That's obviously great and I think it's the same for all of us, right? Uh, whether pastors or, or leaders. But of course, none of us are always at the 100% healthy stage. So we go through life, we go through ups and downs uh, of, of, of that. And I think like what Elaine say is really the functionality. Or if the person is going through journey, uh, I think there are a lot of other factors. Uh, for example, is the person also uh, seeking help? Uh, is the person uh, uh, having someone to journey as they journey along with others? Uh, so those are other factors that we also uh, kind of take into con consideration as a person lead. And uh, I, I am reminded of the illustration whenever you take an air airplane, right? When the face mask, uh, breathing mask comes on, you put on yourself before you help others. Uh, so that, while that is true, uh, I think that we, also, we also journey through our functionality uh, and journey of recovery and all that. So, yeah. Right. Just a follow-up question on this. Um, why do people sometimes feel it's challenging to reach out for help? Like, why do we all struggle? I'm sure you all experienced people before, uh, in, in interaction with people. Why do we all struggle to reach out for help? When we talk about uh, mental health condition or going through that kind of uh, uh, difficulties, right? Whether it is emotions and all that, it's all um, got to do with very silent and, and it a lot of times it may not be seen outright. And when it is so silent, and uh, it, it tends to be stigmatized in the sense that, hey, I look at you, you seem normal, right? It's not like a person with physical challenge that you can see, oh, you know, you're physically challenged, it's visible, it's evident. But when it's suffering in, within ourselves, it is not so clear. And while I can still see you, you seem pretty fine. Right, so and and to the to some extent, the word madness, crazy, and so on, it's so easily blurred out nowadays. You're crazy, yeah, so so, you know that kind. So and with all that, it is somewhat creating that kind of stigma that oh, you know, people have this sort of a negative reaction towards this sort of symptoms. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, it's a good question here to ask for clarity in what is God's grace. It is very easy to encourage one another by using these words, but what does it really mean? Yeah, I, I think God's grace is, um, the width and the breadth of God's grace is encompassing, right? Uh, it, it is the, 
the loving kindness, the, the, the favor, the presence. So it is that little word. I know what you mean when I did read up on grace. It is those few limited English words uh, that try to capture this, this word grace. And it's so rich. Uh, so when, you, when we talk about God's grace, uh, as per what we see in the video, uh, it's, it's a little bit of everything. It, it is God's presence with her. It is when she was at the lowest point in her life, that verse came out and speak to her that helped her sustain through that difficult, uh, that difficult journey. It is uh, the presence of God that helped us through. It, it is that uh, sometimes it is that uh, thankfulness, the goodness that God reminds us that, oh, uh, you are loved, you are, you, are, you, are, you are not forgotten. So this grace allow us to stand uh, when we couldn't uh, stand. Right? The, the grace, uh, I believe, is it, sort of like a transitioning from our own strength towards tapping on to God's resources. And this grace, the resources, is unlimited. This God's grace is unlimited. Strength, healing, comfort, word of God, truth, encouragement, it is unlimited. So it is really tapping into God's unlimited resources for me. Right. Um, I think God's grace comes with also mercy. And His mercies are new every day. Yeah. And I can say that through journeying with people who are really go through, going through so much of pain and grief and sadness and sorrow, yeah, the, 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 I, the thought of coming in into is that how as a father or a parent who hold on to their child, at that time, as I can imagine God's grace being that kind of so vast and so deep, it's unfathomable, that cannot be defined. Okay, this is the most popular question. Uh. Um, is there an ENCM crisis helpline now? Uh? Because uh, we used to call Pastor Tim all the time, but he's not there anymore. Is there a helpline or is there someone we can go to? <laughs> most water question, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think if you talk about in terms of grief, in terms of going through challenges, uh, I think uh, the licensed counsellor is always ready to lend a hand to help you process through things. Uh, of course, uh, I, I joke with people that uh, uh, my number is still the same. <laughs> uh, I, I think in terms of reaching out, I think there are so many uh, leaders and coaches that over the last two weeks, they, they just step up to say, how can we... Uh, how can we help? How can we reach out to people who are hurting? So if you are going through certain things, certain hurt, certain grief, and you need someone to talk to, reach out, reach out to your leaders, reach out to the pastors, reach out to us so that we can help you process that through. Yeah, so I think that is that. Yeah. Okay, so That's I mean, the, there are a lot of help available. So many hotlines. Many hotlines. Later, the hotline will flash out. Okay, uh, you take a picture. Huh? Okay, um, okay. Uh, this is a little bit more about how to care for those people that we know for a fact are going through mental health uh, challenges. Like, how do we support them? What's the best way to support them? There are a lot of questions here. Uh, how do we help them? Because sometimes we may not be doing the right things, saying the right things, right? What are some handles that we can do to support those people that potentially might be uh, in going through some mental health challenges? Right, so this is a very common question. I believe that it comes with, first of all, yourself first, uh, because it will require to check in with yourself whether how much would you actually go to the extent to care. Yeah, uh, because caring can be very subjective as well. So uh, first of all is that to just let the person know that you care. Yeah, and knowing that if the person is going through um, all kinds of challenges, uh, the person may be withdrawing himself or herself. And that is okay. You do not need to really you know, be on the face of the person all the time, but just be a silent uh, carer and, or maybe what I normally say is that I just sit with you. Yeah, sitting with someone, it's show a lot, right? So, um, and, and that do not require or persist the person to respond to you because there are a lot of withdrawals there, which is understandable. So make sure your wordings are seasoned with salt, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that it is not be so insensitive. Like for example, saying words such as, uh, you should be, you know, you should be okay, you're a leader. You should be okay because you seem fine. 
Yeah, so the should and the must kind of a words, I try to you know avoid and refrain. All right, and also perhaps not to be too much in your words. Yeah, telling them in terms of hey, I heard about so and so. That person also went through a hard time, tough time. Also can go. You also can what? It, it, that kind of example. So that can be very insensitive. So. Make sure your words, yeah, in terms of how much you want to go extend to care for the person, and very important that you yourself equip with knowledge and educate yourself first. Yeah. One thing very practical is you can extend help to the primary caregiver. Uh, for example, if you, someone in your life group is you know one is going through that, you can extend help to the spouse yeah, because the spouse will be the primary caregiver. So you can offer things like you know, maybe certain days we, we send food to your house so that the spouse don't have to think of you know, preparing meals or you can think of, hey, you know, we, we, are, we are staying nearby each other. Maybe some days I can help you pick up the kids, for example. So working and helping the caregiver of the person, it's also helpful. Uh, one example is that uh, this couple of months, uh, one of my wife's friend is going through uh, going through this and my wife has been liaising with the mother of that friend and just to offer help and uh, and say that okay this this day my wife know that the mother usually take walks with the daughter and my my wife say okay this day maybe i come by and i'll be the one taking walks with your daughter and my wife offered things like uh, certain days if you need me to pick up uh, your kids from the school because it's the same school as my, my kids. So I think those little things, uh, so not just helping the person but also helping the caregiver of the person. Yeah, so I think that is a very practical help. Okay. So this is question here. I've been helping my friend. I've been listening to them. But sometimes after going through that process of listening, I myself got affected. You know, so so how, how, how do I manage and navigate through that? Right, so it's a sort of like a caregiver burnout in that sense, lah, right? So if you feel that you're emotionally so highly involved in it, so perhaps maybe you, you, you per need to be caring for yourself first. First of all, check with yourself, yeah, what is going on with you? Yeah, perhaps sometimes we call this is also known as uh, transference. Yeah, it's very common among uh, people who are in a helping profession. Yeah, so for example, my clients are going through uh, grief and so on. And uh, I'm also going through grief and so on. So, um, and then I would be easily be experiencing transference through that. Yeah, that and, and so on. Um, yeah, so take note of yourself, your well-being, if you, you yourself need to be supported emotionally, yeah, then that means it's time for you to seek help too, yeah, to find someone to talk to and to process through and so on, yeah, and uh, it's important to also know your boundary, uh, emotional boundary as well, so that it will not be too flooded, yeah, or emotionally flooding, yeah, the person that you're helping, so it's not going to help the person either if you're emotionally flooded there. Yeah, so it's just bouncing off each other. Okay. Okay, next question. Practical question. How can we help people that don't want to be helped? Yeah. I think reach out to the caregiver. Reach out to the, let's say, reach out to the family members. Uh, maybe the friend that you know don't want to be helped. Uh, and I'm sure the caregiver or the family member is feeling helpless as well. So I think for you, you could be a colleague, you could be a live group uh, member, you could be a friend. So I think reach, reaching out to the immediate family to kind of partner together, uh, just, to, just to be there, just to kind of, uh, uh, maybe if you're a colleague, at least, at least the, 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 the parents will know how that person is at work. Uh, so I think... You can't do much if the person don't want to be helped. But I think there is a way of uh, just expressing love and care that that person know that if ever he or she is ready to seek help, uh, they know that you are there. So I think that helps uh, occasional text that, hey, you know, just to, just to share that we are with you and, you know, we, we are praying with you. And just that you don't have to give a lot of advices. Uh, so I think just letting them know that you are there and reaching out to the family members or the primary caregivers to kind of, I guess, tag team or even show support to the caregiver. 
Uh, for me, I can speak for myself, is that uh, we, I receive a lot of calls and inquiries from uh, family members and perhaps maybe concerned friends about, you know, uh, maybe a, a dog family member is going through that and does not want to seek help and so on. So my role is basically to educate the person, uh, to help the person to, uh, to understand that, okay, um, not seeking help with regards to certain severe symptoms and whatnot, to educate the person to be prepared that it might come to a severity uh, phase, yeah, and what to expect when that happened. That means to prepare the person if it's really severe conditions, not seeking help, not willing to, all right? You cannot force the person or nap the person to the hospital and so on, right? So what then would be the outcome or maybe the possible outcome to prepare first? Things will get escalate to some extent, to the, some severity, and when that happens, what to do? So prepare. Preparation. Mm. Awesome. I got a, I think that I'm assuming that this quest, next question, probably of our last two questions, the next question is from someone who may not be a Christian yet. I'm not sure, but he's asking this question. How can God or Jesus help a non-Christian who has depression? Um, I believe that God can help anyone, right? It's not just um, Christians that God can help. Uh, God's peace, uh, God's grace is extended to all. So I believe that if a uh, non-Christian uh, were to reach out uh, to, to you or to reach out uh, to God, I believe that God's grace, God's peace uh, can uh, work through the person. And we have heard so many stories, right, when, when uh, unchurched Christians that... Uh, but actually, I think God is even at work. When I look back at my life, even before I became a Christian, I could see that God is actually at work uh, in the different parts of my life, right? So actually, God do not just start working when we put our trust in Him. Uh, so God can work, uh, just, as, just that sometimes we are not aware, right? So I think that even as a non-Christian, you can encourage them to say, hey, you know, whenever you can, why don't you pray and ask God for peace? And this is how you can pray or you can text them a prayer and you can... Uh, help them to have that open bridge that when they reach to God, and I believe that God is merciful, God is loving, uh, and God can uh, work uh, in them even before they know God. Yeah. This is our last question, I, and I don't want to miss out this question. It's not really a question, it's a statement, but I wanted to ask a question based off this statement. And here it goes. One part of my mental self has created hate, anger, towards everything. When someone says that you are not alone, but in reality, I know everyone has left me. I didn't want to not answer this question, not want to acknowledge this statement. But I want to ask Pastor and Elaine, um, how can someone find, still find hope where indeed, when I'm still feeling very alone, I'm still very lonely and people have somehow deserted me for whatever reasons may so. What can I do? What can I do as a friend or what can I do as the person? As the person. As a person. I think in situations like this, our emotion takes over, right? Uh, when we are in that moment, uh, anger takes over, uh, bitterness takes over, emotion takes over. Uh, so I think what we can do, I know it's probably easier said than done, is when we are more calm, uh, I think is to probably list down uh, our, what we are feeling. And, and I, I sometimes tell this to people who maybe they're going through so, so much in their mind, to list down their emotion and to kind of sift through what is feeling and what is facts, right? And sometimes it gets jumbled up. Uh, so to sift through to say, okay, this is how I feel. But the fact is that, hey, my friend and my mom has always, uh, has always tried to reach out to me. Okay, but I've rejected them for the last how many months. Uh, so I think to help to sift out, uh, and I, I think it's uh, potentially quite common to feel that people deserted you. But maybe to bring about a different perspective to know that sometimes when we are going through that, we also shut people off. 
uh, from reaching out to us. We push people away, we shut people off and sometimes they don't know what to say or do because we may pinpoint, yeah, the other day he said this or the other day he did that. But I think to be fair, uh, there are a lot of people who may care for you and, but they do not know how, what to do, what not to do. They may say the wrong things but look past the words and look past that and to look at their heart and, and, and that's where, uh, or maybe talk to someone out of that circle, talk to someone neutral, right? Talk to a, a, a licensed counsellor who do not know your friends, do not know people who deserted you, so, so to speak. Speak to someone neutral who do not know your situation or do not know your, your, your friends and family situation. Maybe that will help as well. I think uh, for that person who posted that is that I will be interested to know what's going on at the cognitive phase. That means what's going on in terms of your lines and thoughts, your processes at this level. Because chances of what is going on or playing in the mind influence how you feel about self. What's going on at this level could be also influenced by your past experiences that are mostly unpleasant. Yeah, it could be things that's happening, your situation, you're in crisis and so on. And that form the kind of the evidence to you that will influence how you feel. Hopeless, worthless and so on. Then there's a lot of exploration over there. It could be also your family, your upbringing, your dynamics and all that is so complicated. And henceforth, it influences how you feel and mostly unpleasant. If you keep on thinking about that at this level, it influences how you feel at that low at your lowest, okay? And then I will look at your behavior. What are you doing about it? Yeah? So the thinking, the emotion, the feelings, and then it influences what you do about it. Chances of is that perhaps maybe the behavior is withdrawing yourself, shutting down, you know, and so on. And it goes back to the feeling of resentment, hurt, bitterness, and so on. It goes back and forth, back and forth, like a crazy cycle, right? So go through that and then if you feel that, hey, you can find someone to trust, maybe a professional, this is where we come in to help you to sort of realign that, break that crazy cycle, so to speak. And then you probably will feel differently. Yeah, because I cannot tell you to, oh, you're hopeless, you feel hopeful. Oh, you're sad, you feel happy. Yeah, you can, we cannot change how we feel as much as we want to. Okay. Right. Right. Well, um, I know there are a lot of questions here. I think this is a very, very relevant series. I applaud the church for taking uh, full advantage of the people that we have around us to equip everyone here to go through this season. So thank you so much for your questions. Now, if you need prayer or you are those people that ask those questions and you want those questions to be answered, please step forward. We have our prayer, prayer team here. The pastoral team will be here. Um, service has ended. Please follow through with us our next series as we go through this whole um, series coming soon in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day.